Hi, my name is Colin Skimbeng and I'm the sugar cane breeder for the LSU Ag Center. I'm domiciled here at the Sugar Research Station in St. Gabriel, Louisiana. And uh, the main focus of my research is to develop new genetically improved varieties of sugar cane for the Louisiana sugar industry. Last year, I took advantage of the virtual field day model to give you a glimpse of the very early stages of our variety development program. Our stakeholders don't get to see the early stages of the program where we perform crosses, we harvest seed, we plant the seed, we transplant seedlings to the field, we select the seedlings, and we plant the first few clonal stages uh, of the program. What they are more familiar with is the advanced stages of the program where we plant clones in multiple locations across the state. And it is that data that we use to recommend a variety for release. This year, we released two new varieties to the Louisiana sugar industry, L14267 and HOCP14885. Dr. Pontiff is going to talk to you about the, character the characteristics of these new varieties that make them awesome choices for the Louisiana sugar industry. What I'd like to do this year is to talk to you about the process that leads to the release of these varieties. Plant breeding is like finding a needle on a haystack. Each year we plant about 100,000 seedlings to begin a new selection cycle. But the first thing you want to do is select the parents that are going to participate in the crossing that are going to lead to the seed that gives you these seedlings. The selection of parents is very, very important. Here in St. Gabriel, we have 324 spots on the crossing card. So that's very valuable real estate. And we go through a very judicious process to select the parents that we're going to use for crossing each year. Once you've selected your parents, you go through the process of making them flower. Once those parents flower, the next thing you want to do is put the best combination of parents to make a cross. Why that is important is because you shuffle the genes in the male parents and in the female parents and you bring them together in a cross and you get new genetic combinations. That new genetic combination is what would determine that progeny's performance in several different locations and throughout its life cycle. So it's very important that you select the best parents and you make the best crosses. We try to stay away from crosses that don't bring anything in the uh, to the table. For example, we try to avoid crosses where the two parents are susceptible to the same disease or where the two parents are very closely related. Once we make a cross, we, we harvest the seed, we grow out the seed, we transplant the seedlings to the field and um, we let the seedlings grow for one year let Mother Nature take its course, and then the next year we go back and we select from that seedling population. Like I tried to describe last year, the most important things we look for during the first round of selection is that we, we drop the obvious things that show uh, infection with diseases or insects, and then we use our cane knife and cut the ceiling and inspect the stalk. If it has pith, we toss it out. If it doesn't have pith, we keep it. We then drag out two stalks from each seedling stool that we've selected, and we break those stalks. We break them and we compare the bricks value to the brick values of um, uh, current varieties that are grown in the state. If the bricks value is higher than the ones for the varieties grown in the state, we keep it and we plant those seedlings in the first clonal stage. Let me go show you what the first clonal stage looks like. All right, now that I've talked to you about how we select the seedling to the first clonal stage, I'm standing right here in our first clonal stage trial that we planted last year. Look at all the variation that you get in this small area. Let's look at a plot like this, plot 108. We are probably not going to select this clone because of the open habit. It is going to be a problem for harvesting because when the harvester is going down the row, it's going to knock out the clones that are all spread into the next row. And then secondly, the open habit uh, makes it not um, amass enough stalks. We like uh, clones that stand straight and tall like this clone over here in plot 308. As you can see it's standing straight tall, nice green leaves, no uh, evidence of disease compared to say this clone over here where it's obvious that it's going to have uh, a brown rust disease. We can see brown rust disease on the leaves and uh, this clone over here it's obvious that this clone had um, leaf skull as evidence from the pencil mark. It probably would grow out of it, but um, it's a problem for our industry. If a clone in a small plot like this already shows leaf skull, it means if we plant it in the whole industry, leaf skull might become a problem. So we will likely not select this clone. 
I've seen another clone over there and I'm very excited about this clone over here. So these are the types of clones that excite us when we are selecting. So the first thing we do in the first clonal stage is we walk through these plots. It's as if the plants are talking to us. So we're able to eliminate the obvious uh, clones that have deficiencies. For example, like I showed you before, the clones that obviously have uh, diseases such as uh, brown rust or leaf skull are going to be dropped from further consideration. The next thing we do is we uh, come and we look at the clones that we did not drop. We use our cane knife, we, we take uh, a few stalks, look at it. If it has pith, we toss it. If it doesn't have pith, we keep it in the program. After that, we come back again for the third round of selection and we brix those clones and we compare the brix value of those clones to the brix value of varieties that are currently grown in the industry. If the brix values of the experimental clones are higher, we keep those clones. If the brix values are lower, we toss those clones. We generally select about say 400 to about 500 clones from the first clonal stage and progress that to the second clonal stage. I'm going to show you how our second clonal trials look like. Okay, so in the second clonal trial stage, we try to look for areas on the farm that have a different soil texture compared to where we planted the first line trial stage. You can notice that in the, the, the first line trial stage, this, uh, the, the, the texture of the soil is uh, sandy, textured soil and loose. And the second line trial stage, we planted on soil that is a little bit more clay than the first line trial stage. All right, I'm standing right here in the second clonal trial stage. The obvious thing to see here is that the plot is a little longer, bigger than the first line trial plot. We go through the same process where we walk through these plots and the first thing we do is drop the obvious ones that are not going to make it. For example, this plot right here has smut. So obviously we're not going to select this plot. So we walk through it, we drop for obvious things like smut, we cut uh, the cane with a cane knife and we look for pith. Those that have pith are tossed. And then we actually sample these uh, plots and send them to the lab. So this is the first stage that instead of using bricks as a measure, we use sucrose as a measure. We compare the sucrose values of these clones to that of the commercial varieties that are available uh, in the industry. And those that have higher sucrose values are kept. We also measure things like fiber, and um, cane yield, we estimate cane yield, and we're able to decide which clones to select from this plot and advance them to the next stage of the program. So uh, we planted about uh, 300 clones in the second uh, clonal stage, and by the end of the selection process, we end up with about 50 clones. And this is the first time we're taking these clones out of the station. So we plant them at three different locations, uh, one at the St. Gabriel uh, station, one at the USDA station, and another uh, location is the LSU Act Center, Iberia Research Station. So we try all these uh, clones over there and uh, by the end of the process we select about 20 clones and plant them in uh, five more locations and this time we plant them in farmers fields. These uh, trials are managed by the growers and the selection is done by us. At the end of that process again we, we, we select about one to five clones and we plant them in 12 more locations across the state. At that stage we we sample locations that have light soils and heavy soils so that we can begin to sample the different soil types uh, that are in the state. Throughout the process, we try to sample different soil types. So these trials are managed by the growers and we um, harvest the trials and they collect data from these trials. Sometimes during the process, we also give these clones to the, our plant pathologists, our entomologists, our agronomists, and our um, weed scientists to start uh, doing some experiments on these clones. We also give these clones to the um, American Sugarcane League so they can start uh, beefing up the, um, the material. So if the clone gets released to the industry, they will have enough to distribute to the growers. So at this point, I would like to thank uh, the growers that uh, participate with us. Um, it's not easy to participate with us because um, our trials are not like a regular uh, plot in your field. We, we start and we stop and you can see we, we leave gaps to, um, to uh, designate the start and the end of, um, of a different varieties so we can know which variety that we're harvesting. So I would like to thank the growers that participate uh, in collaboration with us. And I would also like to, to thank the state and the uh, contribution to our research that we get from the American Sugarcane League. Thank you.